Hard talk has come to eastern Congo, notorious as Africa's killing field, where in recent years ethnic and economic warfare has cost millions of lives. But the remarkable thing about this place isn't just the death toll. War has brought with it another scourge, endemic sexual violence. And the truth is, the prime victims of Congo's war haven't been the soldiers, it's been the women. Early morning in a church in Goma. The song is a celebration of resilience and renewal, and it comes from the heart. Most of the women in this hall have been raped, many of them gang raped and subject to grotesque brutality. But this isn't just a gathering of victims, it's the voice of a community which calls itself Heal Africa. Because Jesus went through all this suffering, he's ready to help us, even in trials. Patients, nurses, doctors and counsellors worship together. There's plenty of courage to be found here, not least the courage of women prepared to tell the truth about the horrors happening in their own land. Sometimes to talk at all is hard enough. I would like you to tell me your story. What, what happened to you? How bad were your injuries? I mean, how, what did the doctors say was wrong with you? And now, what do the doctors say? I just wonder how all of this has affected you. How do you feel about your life and about uh, particularly about men now? Last question. I, I would like to know how you feel in your spirits now. I mean, do you feel angry or depressed mm. or frightened? Mm. How, how would you describe your feelings right now? Mm. It's impossible to make sense of what has happened to women in eastern Congo without reflecting on the damage done by more than a decade of war. The genocide in neighboring Rwanda ended with many of the Hutu perpetrators fleeing into eastern Congo. They brought their brutality and violence to an area already riven with communal tensions. Congo's central government was incapable of imposing stability and the rule of law in this vast mineral-rich region. 
The result, millions of civilians living at the mercy of warlords and militia groups. Tens of thousands of child soldiers and young men were recruited by some of these groups. They were abused and in turn abused others. In some areas, investigators have found two-thirds of women saying they've experienced rape or sexual violence. In the words of one former UN commander, women became the prime victims of the conflict. In the province of North Kivu today, more than a million civilians are internal refugees many in camps like this one, just outside Goma. The more ties of community, family and tradition have been broken, the more sexual violence has spread. In the camps themselves, UN and NGO workers report disturbing patterns of sexual abuse. Heal Africa's hospital in Goma gives specialist treatment to dozens of women every month whose bodies have been terribly damaged by rape and assault by gun barrel or other weapons. But remember, for every woman here, there are many more who never get treatment for their debilitating internal injuries. Virginie Mumbere is one of the pillars of Heal Africa. She's seen thousands of women pass through here. When the women come here, it, it's not just a question of, of healing their, their wounds uh, physically. You also have to heal their, their mental scars, their wounds. How, how do you do that? Yes, we have um, a number of wise ladies that we call here counselors. And uh, these people have been trained how to listen, how to have compassion, how to, 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 to be near that uh, lady who has been raped and go through all steps when they are here. And from here, if, if the lady came from, uh, from far, we have a system of these wise ladies throughout all the... The, the place where we intervene. And so even if she had been just here, when she goes back, she'll find another, uh, another wise lady that make the follow-up. We see children here in, in the hospital sanctuary. Yeah. Are some of these children the, the result of, of rapes? Yes, some. And what is going to happen to the mothers and, and the children who mm. Uh, you know, have gone through this experience, and mm. particularly mm. what happens to the children um, mm. produced by these, these terrible rapes? Mm. At the beginning it was difficult, and even some of them could say that I don't want to keep that child, because whenever I'll be seeing him or her, I'll be remembering all the terrible things I went through. And then, uh, thanks to the mediation of those wise ladies, I remember the story of one lady who arrived, and when she arrived, she had infections in her, in her breast, and she said that uh, the militias were taking needles, and they were, and she was pregnant at that moment. She said, I don't know how I can keep this baby, because all the time I'll be remembering what they did for, uh, to me. And then, we, then the counselor told them that the baby is innocent. He didn't want to come. But as far as he is already there, <coughs> he's God creature, you need to love him. And did she end up loving her baby? Yes, she did. She did. And I have some pictures of her. But do the families, the wider families, the, the parents, the brothers, sisters, back in the home village, should they accept the women, and particularly the women who come back with, with raped babies? At the beginning, it was also difficult. But apart from the counselors, the, this wise lady, I'm sorry, I have a, a kind of cough. <clears throat> we also have other community leaders. They are made of um, um, Catholic priests, uh, pastors, 
uh, imams, they are together, and we have we 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 taught them some leadership uh, trainings. We gave, Hill Africa gave them some leadership trainings in order to help these wise men or wise ladies whenever it's difficult, in order to integrate the lady of the community, especially by explaining that she's innocent. She didn't want that to arrive to her, so she 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 she, does, she doesn't need need to be excluded from the community. And then after explaining, and as far as when she's here, she's trying to learn some skills that she can go to communicate in the community, she becomes... Uh, but she's it, it, it doesn't always work, does it? Because I've read some figures from particular uh, projects that NGOs have been running where maybe 10% yes, of the only. women who return home mm. after treatment for the injuries from sexual violence and rape they are not accepted, and they have to leave their home villages and leave their families. Yes, there are some. And there are some who have been rejected by their husbands. So we have two, the, the two possibilities. And some other husbands, they even came here to care for their wives. So it depends on the temperature and the mood of each. Can Congo ever overcome the problem of sexual violence, which you've lived with for so many years now? The first uh, uh, group of ladies that we received here said that they were from uh, the militias who, were, who came from Rwanda. And that's how it began. Because I remember that at the beginning, even our, our soldiers, Congolese, uh, Congolese soldiers, I lived in Kinshasa and everywhere, they were not doing such things. I think it's a habit that we, has been brought to us from from Ron, I'm sorry to say that, but... but it's come with my, the war. Yeah, it and came with the war. So the, if the war stopped, and if they, as they've already put regulation for punish, punishing people who are doing it, I think it will stop. You're an optimist. Yes, I'm optimist. I guess you have to be. <laughs> uh, we have to be, because we, need, we, we hope that uh, in uh, 2020 we'll have a better Congo, in which our our daughters won't be fearing to be raped and to, to undergo what we are undergoing now. Virginie Mumberi, thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you and very much. Thank you for coming and tell all the world about the situation we, under, we are undergoing here. Heal Africa is a haven for women recovering from rape. As well as the medical treatment and counselling, there's an effort to give these women skills they can use when they return to their communities. I spoke to another patient. She was gang raped while still a schoolgirl. Only now, at 18, has she received the treatment she needed. What has it been like for you to have to um, cope with all of the pain uh, and, and the suffering that you've had. Do you, do you believe it's important uh, to tell people what happened to you and what has happened to so many other girls and women in Eastern Congo? Do you think you can be happy again? Thank you very much for talking to us. The international community says something must be done to protect Congo's women. We've heard it from the UN Secretary General, from the European Parliament and many others. But how can outside intervention fix a broken, dysfunctional society, particularly when the Congolese government has so comprehensively failed to deliver on either prevention or justice.
There are now tough laws against rape here in the Congo, but the vast majority of rapists go unpunished. And the central government in Kinshasa seems unwilling or unable to change that situation. So what can the international community do? Well, the UN here says that it has beefed up its efforts to counter sexual violence. But the truth is many of the most tangible, the most impressive efforts to deal with this problem are coming from smaller international NGOs who are working with local communities. Desiree Svank, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Let's start with the women themselves. How difficult is it for a woman in Congo uh, to recover, and I'm not just talking physically, from the rapes that are so common? Well, first of all, it's very important for a woman that has undergone this terrible experience that there will be justice, that she will actually see that the perpetrators will be held responsible for their crime and um, you know, end up in some kind of court, in some kind of prison. Um, but Does that happen? No, and this is, uh, this is a huge issue. It happens much too rarely. Maybe 10% of rape cases are brought to uh, a court, actually, and then um, a great number of them, if they actually get sentenced, they get out again very quickly. But this is all connected to the problem that there's not enough of legal counsel so uh, oftentimes the evidence gets lost even after the woman is raped but the other problem is that um, the state does not invest resources into the judiciary system so um, the adjudication of sexual violence is is not sufficient um, now apart from this of course there is the medical aspect of the woman healing from the different uh, diseases that she may suffer, you know, 80%, more than 80% of the victims actually get infected by STDs. To be clear about it, many of the rapes that are happening in Congo today are very brutal. Yes, extremely brutal. They are brutal. extremely cruel. And gang rapes. And uh, so... And what, why? 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 Why is it that in this country women are being attacked in a way that we don't see so very often in other parts of the world. What is happening here? Well, Congo has been ravaged by war for too many decades. It has a very difficult history. And uh, when you think about a whole generation, a second generation of young men now that have been raised in this war, that have fought in this war, aside child soldiers partly, um, uh, that actually has an impact on society. And uh, it's not just women that suffer. All of society is profoundly brutalized by this conflict. Uh, are you saying that there's something about the relationships between men and women in Congo which also plays into the prevalence of sexual violence? Absolutely. There's a destruction of the social fabric. And within that, you know, um, relations between men and women may be unequal as far as education is concerned, economic resources and um, status. And when now there is a disruption in the social fabric, this can uh, actually lead to women losing all of the respect that they are normally given and basically being stripped of, of any social status that is left and just reduced to um, sexual objects that are can be used by whoever wants to. There's a very problematic connection between um, sex, women's sexuality and value. It's like, you know, it's com perceived as completely normal that a man pays for, um, for a woman's sexuality. And if he can't pay for that, it's still his right to have it, so he must take it by force. Is it any of your business, the relationship between men and women in Congo? You are German, you've studied gender issues. Is it any of your business? <laughs> This is a question that I think every development worker should ask themselves frequently, just in order to be reflective on what we do here. And I personally think that it is an issue that everybody should be concerned with. We live in a global community and we all must reach out to one another to ensure that there are no crimes against humanity that uh, you know, not any one woman in this world will be barred from having the same opportunities that women have back 
where I am from. When mm -hmm. you see a woman who is told by her husband to walk literally mm. 20 or 30 kilometers with a heavy load on her head, or worse, you see women who, as some we've spoken to here, mm. have experienced the most terrible gang rapes and yeah. have gone home and then been raped again. Yes. When you see all of that and then you say, I can tell men about masculinity and about a different perception of masculinity, does that have any meaning here? You have to start somewhere. And the community-based approach to help all of society to heal from this terrible sickness that is violence of all kinds, um, I think that that actually is a form of support that you know, needs to be given. That's why there are millions actually given to these community-based approaches and to civil society. But you can do a lot of things wrong there, and so you need to be sure that you have the right expertise to, um, to really implement it properly. But I do have these moments of complete helplessness and of anger. You can't avoid it when you are working here and you are from a certain background. But you always have to put it in perspective because these women are not just victims and these men are just not only perpetrators. You know, you have to see them as multifaceted beings that are not just rapists and not just victims. There are many more things and it's me that's learning so much from them and their strengths and their outlook on life and their hope also for the future. I'm interested that you talk about the personal mm -hmm. element because it seems to me you've made a commitment to this mm -hmm. place. You're going to live here for two years, maybe more. Maybe three years. Yeah. Doing the work you're doing. Do you not fear that you might be overwhelmed by despair at, at the terrible stories you hear every single day? Um, well, when I first came here, it was as a student. I was doing research here and I, um, I realized that this is what I wanted to do because as much as there is hardship here, what most people don't perceive in the outside world is there's also a lot of strength, a lot of joy, a lot of resources within the community. And that is actually what I hold on to. Um, of course, there is that concern and you know that most foreigners that come out here to work for a long time are provided with psychological care by their organizations and I'm no exception in this um, but I, I don't think that it is um, that it should be perceived as this impossible thing to do it actually is absolutely possible to live here with a sane mind and 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 with a sane heart um, because if I despair I'm not of help to anybody, right? I'm pretty useless there. Desiree Zwang, thank you so much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you for coming here.